Welcome to our small acreage webinar today on high tunnels for specialty crop production in Colorado. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the small acreage management coordinator for the Front Range. And I'd like to thank Colorado State University Extension and the Natural Resources Conservation Service for presenting this webinar today. With me is Dan Goldhammer, who's the research associate for Colorado State University Specialty Crops Program. And he'll be giving our presentation today. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to your screen if you're new to webinars. Um, check out the chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This is the place that we can communicate with each other. So if you have any questions or comments or IT difficulties during the presentation, you can type your problem or question in there and hit enter, and we'll be able to communicate you, with you in that way. Behind the scenes is Ruth Wilson, um, who's our IT help today, and so she'll be able to help you out with any IT problems along the way, if you should have any. Um, so our format for today is we are going to, or Dan's going to be talking for about 45 minutes, and then if you can hold your questions until our question and answer time at the end, we'll have plenty of time at the end to take lots of questions. So before we get started, I'd like to just pop up four survey questions. So we have some questions just to help us get to know who you are and what your interests are. So we'll have a few questions before and after Dan's presentation. So, so for now, just use your mouse and if you could please answer these questions. So the first one is tell us who you are in relationship to high tunnels. So um, if you're a, a producer or a professional or a student or other. The second one is, are you planning to install a high tunnel? Thirdly, do you have a high tunnel now? And then fourth, do you or please rate your knowledge of high tunnels currently? So if you can go ahead and take a minute and answer those questions, and I will hand the mic over to Dan, and we can get started on his presentation. So go ahead and sit back and relax, and um, we'll listen to Dan's talk. Thanks. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, like Jennifer said, my name is Dan Goldhammer, and I work at Colorado State University in the Specialty Crops Program. And today I'd like to talk about high tunnel production of specialty crops in Colorado. So I just want to give a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. First, we'll go into a quick introduction of what high tunnels are. Then we'll move on to design considerations, followed by summer production, followed by winter production, and a quick little bit on the economics of high tunnel and finally finishing up with some future research needs. So to begin, I just want to talk about what are high tunnels in case you're unfamiliar with what they are. The nomenclature is a little confusing. High tunnels can also be known as hoop houses and or solar greenhouses. And they can range drastically in sizes and shapes. So a general definition though would be a freestanding or a gutter connected structure that is tall enough to stand in and provides a protective environment. And what differentiates high tunnels from greenhouses is that they're generally much simpler and much lower cost. Here are just some pictures of a high tunnel. Here's the high tunnels we have out at the Colorado State University Research Farm. You can see this is a tunnel without any covering, and this is the frame. And in the back are the tunnels with the frame and covered. Here's another high tunnel. It's in Dolores, Colorado at Stone Free Farm. It's a different style. It's a Gothic style compared to what we had out at the research farm, which is a Quonset style. And then here's an example of a gutter connected high tunnel. As you can see there, that's where the different bays connect um, at the gutter. So when you are trying to think about if you want a high tunnel or where you're going to put it, you need to first think about some of the design considerations. Overall, these include the topography of the site, the orientation of the tunnel, the soil at the site, your access to irrigation and utilities, and zoning and permits. Overall, what you're trying to do is extend your season or capture more heat for in the growing area. So what you really want to do is avoid low places in the landscape. These basically can funnel cold air down into your tunnel. And so if you're in a valley, you might want to consider placing it up 
not at the very bottom of the valley. Also, you want to find a site that is level, that has level ground or has a slight slope. This slight slope might actually help you in the winter times if you're trying to drain out your irrigation system. Overall, again, what we're trying to do here with this protective environment is to maximize solar exposure and getting full sun. And to do that, what you want to first do is look at your surrounding area and avoid any shadows from trees or buildings or other impediments. And you also have to consider seasonal changes in your landscape. If you go out there and you're designing your high tunnel in the middle of winter, the shading could be vastly different in the summer if you have trees that leaf out in the summer. And here in Colorado at our latitude, we generally like to run high tunnels going east to west. This not only maximizes your solar exposure, especially during the winter months, but also runs in parallel to the strongest wind trends in our areas. Um, so you're experiencing less damage from wind. So when you're looking at, at your site, you definitely want to consider the soil there. Really important is the drainage, and that's definitely related to the texture of your soil. If your soil has too much clay in it, the tunnel won't drain properly, and you can get much pooling of water and just unhealthy soil conditions. Also, what you want to consider is the fertility of the soil. That you, this is a prime real estate for what you're trying to grow, and so you need very fertile soil. And to ensure that, you need to do, get soil tests at the beginning, and we also recommend getting annual soil tests to make sure you're not becoming deficient in any pro micronutrients. Also, what you need to consider is soil preparation uh, before you actually start building the tunnel. This is the easiest time it is to work with your soil. If you need to amend it in any way or if even the soil will support the structure. And overall, you're growing high value crops in these tunnels and they need a high value soil. What you also need to consider is the ir access to irrigation water and utilities. You're definitely going to need to irrigate in the tunnels since it's usually covered off from ambient rainfall. And in order to do that, you need access to high quality water throughout the growing, the period you're planning on growing. So we want, we suggest that you get your water tested annually or periodically in terms of looking at uh, the salinity of it and other factors. Also, you need to consider if you're going to try and grow these tunnels, uh, you utilize the tunnels year round and grow throughout the winter, you want to have access to frost free hydrants. Overall, access to electricity is not necessary unless you want to advance more advanced access, more advanced climate control systems, such as automated vents or fans. Also, you need to consider access to other aspects of your farming operation. How close is the tunnel to where you store all your equipment, where you do all the processing of your produce, and where you store the produce? This becomes a particularly important aspect if you're doing winter production, in that it makes everything harder, and that if you don't have a nice dry and warm place to process and store your vegetables, you're going to have a much harder time going to market and just being motivated to grow throughout the winter. This, and finally you need to consider zoning and permits. And this can be sort of a tricky issue. Under some circumstances, in some locations, high tunnels can be classified as a temporary structure, which require little or no permits. However, if you're running permanent utilities out there, or anything else, you need to talk with your local officials to ensure you're meeting up to code and also getting the right permits. So now that you have your site all figured out, you need to actually decide what kind of high tunnel you're going to be there. For that, you need to first look at what kind of frame you're going to build. And for your frame, you need to consider the size of the frame, the actual shape of the frame, the material that the frame will be built out of, how you're going to construct your end walls of the frame, the loads of your frame will endure. These include wind loads, snow loads, and dead loads. How you're going to cover your frame, and then after you cover it, how are you going to ventilate it, how you're going to irrigate within the frame, and whether or not you want your high tunnels to be movable. Overall, high tunnels have a wide variety of widths and lengths. They can range from as narrow as 14 feet to as, long as, as wide as 40 feet, and they can be as long as needed. One thing to consider when the, just selecting the size of your tunnel is that the narrow tunnels have more perimeter space compared to larger ones per unit area of growing space. This will impact, the edges will impact your growing 
methods because they're colder and they usually less tall. Um, so you really don't want to maximize perimeter space, but rather internal growing space. Also, the larger the tunnel will be, the more uniform the temperature will be. This is because it contains a larger air mass, and so you'll see less drastic shifts in heating and cooling uh, throughout the day and at night. However, like all things, bigger is not always better, and the bigger you get, you need to consider increased ventilation and the loads that the tunnel will endure. Also, we'll address this again, but when you're looking at your tunnel size, you need to address how you're going to access within the tunnel with equipment. If you're going to have to drive your tractor in there, it needs to be tall enough to accommodate that. Whereas if you're only using a walk-behind tractor or a tiller, you can have more flexibility with the size. Now this is something that's really important. Um, we recommend that the ribs are spaced no more than four feet apart. And I think you might be able to save a couple bucks in construction if you're buying less ribs and spacing them out further. But really, that's just compromising the structure and integrity of the, of the high tunnel. And you could save a couple bucks right now, but might lose everything to a wind or a snowstorm. And the other thing you need to consider is the shape of the frame itself. There's two predominant styles. There's the Quonset and then there's the Gothic side, side style, shape. This is a Quonset style. Um, it's basically just a semicircle from the ground to the ground. The advantage of this is they're usually lower cost, they're simpler, and they're something you can build yourself. The other style is a Gothic style. And the advantages of this style is that it sheds snow better, has more useful space at the sides because it has these vertical sidewalls compared to the rounded sidewalls. And overall, they usually contain a larger internal protected space, so that helps regulate temperature. Once you decide what shape you want, you have to decide what materials you'll make them out of. The two predominant materials are PVC and metal. The advantages of PVC is its lower cost, and however, it, need, it is much less durable than metal. Overall, also you need to make sure it's UV treated and or painted with paint that is compatible with PVC. If you're building a high tunnel yourself, you need a minimum thickness of at least Schedule 40. For metal, the advantages are that it's stronger and it lasts longer. However, it can be more expensive. Overall, the metal can either be a round or square stock, and most of, most of the metal frames are from a kit. However, if you do want to build your own, you can make them out of conduit. This is usually a lower cost, but lower quality option. So once you have your frame shape and size selected, you have to figure out how to close the ends, or even if you want to close the ends. The, there's a bunch of different styles from roll-ups, from a roll-up to a door, and lots of different designs. But what you need to, again, consider is access to your equipment, whether you'll be able to drive your tractor in there, if it provides adequate ventilation, whether it can stand up to the wind loads that you're going to experience, and if it's functional. It's pretty hard to design and, and keep a door maintained, but there's lots of good ways to do it out there. So I su suggest you look at those. Another thing you need to consider is the wind loads. We have very strong winds here in Colorado that can either actually elevate and take your tunnel away or decimate it. This is a, a tunnel in Kansas that got just absolutely destroyed by a windstorm. And to ensure you, you don't get, your tunnel doesn't get destroyed by wind, you need to always anchor your tunnel and ensure you have the proper rib spacing. Also, snow load here is a real issue. If you're growing year-round in high tunnels, collapse it can definitely happen. Here's a picture of a collapse that we saw in a tunnel that didn't quite have adequate rib spacing. It was at six feet. And just as about they were going to go clear it off by hand, it collapsed. So if your tunnel is not shedding snow, you need to go out and clear it manually. Some ways to protect yourself against snow loads is providing additional heat or a double inflated uh, poly coat, uh, covering, which can help shed snow, shed, shed snow, or 
uh, if it is not shedding, you deflate it and then add the additional heat, which helps the snow melt. The final load you need to consider is the dead loads. The dead loads are such things as trellised crops that are, and these loads are not accounted for in the design of the frame. Therefore, what you should really be doing is not trellising them directly to the frame, but rather providing an additional and independent support, such as driving stakes into the outside of tunnels and running a wire through the tunnel. As you can see here, there's lots of fruit and lots of plant material on these trellises, and so you want to make sure you're not connecting that to the actual frame itself, because it's not designed for that. So now that you've considered all those loads on your frame and the size and the shape of the frame, what you want to now consider is how are you going to actually provide the protected environment of, within the frame. And to do that, you have to cover the frame. And the most common covering for a frame is a 6 mil uh, poly plastic. You don't want to use just general plastic. You want to use special greenhouse grade plastic that's both UV and treated and infrared coated. Um, this will provide a much better product in terms of getting light into your tunnel and retaining heat. The option here you also have to select from is whether you want a single layer of poly or a double layer of poly. How the double layer works is it's one layer underneath and then another layer immediately over it and an inflated airspace between those two. The advantages of the double layer of poly is it provides more insulation and is usually a gener generally tighter fit than the single layer. However, some disadvantages are you get decreased slice trans transmittance and it's a basically doubles your plastic cost and adds another complexity or something that can go wrong to your high tunnel. There's also screenings rather than plastic that are available. These are insect screenings and they provide a really nice growing climate. They don't provide as much insulation compared, uh, compared to the poly but they provide some insulation and not as quite as drastic temperatures shifts during the daytime or the nighttime. If you want to learn more about the different options and coverings, you can see the CSU Specialty Crop website for a study that was conducted comparing many different types of coverings. And so once you've decided on what kind of covering you want, you have to attach the cover to the frame. This is most normally achieved with wiggle wire or channel lock systems. Here's the wiggle wire, here's the channel lock. How the wiggle wire, wire works is you place the, the track on, a, on the baseboard or a, and then stretch the plastic over into it and then the wire fits within um, the track and holds it tight that way. The same works for the channel lock, except instead of having a wire, you have a top piece and a bottom piece with the plastic in between. Additionally, what we recommend is providing additional tightness by running straps over both sides of the tunnel. We use old drip tape, and that works really great. It just helps to keep the cover attached and everything nice and tight. So once you have your cover attached to your frame, you need to figure out how you're going to ventilate your frame because it can get really hot during the summer if everything's closed up. Oh, the two ways you can do that is with your end walls and with your side walls. If you're only vent ventilating with end walls, you're limited to about a 50-foot maximum length of a tunnel, whereas with side walls, you can have as long as you want. The ways to ventilate on your end walls is either through your door, and there's also products that are passively uh, opening wax joints, and these can be fitted to vents, and they're a really nice design. For the side walls, you can have either a roll up or a roll down side. We have a roll up side here at CSU. As you can see, the covering is just attached to a big long pipe that can roll up or down the side of the frame um, as needed. Additional more advanced options are ridge vents and fans. These are usually automated and need electricity, so that adds another complexity level of complexity to your tunnel. And once you have everything covered up and ventilated, you also need to consider how you're going to irrigate your crop. Your two major options are drip irrigation and overhead. The advantages of the drip irrigation is that it's very efficient 
and it can keep the actual plant leaf surface dry. This is really beneficial in terms of avoiding disease and insect pressures. How, and also, the drip can be combined with mulch to help reduce weed pressure. And this is particularly helpful in the summer months when the weed pressure is greatest. For your overhead option, you can either have overhead sprinklers that are on the ground or suspended. This is generally preferred when you're working, trying to germinate things within the tunnel rather than transplant. And it's particularly useful if you're trying to produce greens. Also, if you're having trouble ventilating and need to cool off your crop, overhead irrigation can help cool off a crop. And then again, they can be either suspended or on the ground. Your final consideration should be uh, whether you want your high tunnel movable. There's different ways to make that movable. And it can either be that your tunnel can run on top of tracks or have skids that you can drag with a tractor. The real big advantage of having movable tunnels is that it can help you address some of your scheduling issues, whether you're trying to grow tomatoes in the summer and but you need to have your greens production for the winter started earlier than you can max than your tomato crop is done by. This can also work well in the spring if you start something early within the tunnel, then move it to a new location after the weather is better, and then you can transplant your tomato right into that. However, movable tunnels also add another layer of complexity, and you need to think about your access to utilities at all locations that it may be at, and how to move the tunnel without damaging crops either within the tunnel currently or uh, that you're moving the tunnel onto. Another important thing that we need to stress again is that you need to always anchor your tunnel whenever you move it. You don't want it flying away and losing your investment. Now I just want to go over some quick uh, aspects of your summer production. So your typical crops for summer production include tomatoes, peppers, herbs, cucumber, cut flower, stra and strawberries. For tomatoes, we recommend using greenhouse varieties. This will allow you to trail some and get much more yield per square foot of tunnel. The advantages of using tunnels for peppers is that you can actually get a more reliable colored pepper production rather than in the field. Some of the benefits of summer production in high tunnels compared to the field is that it can extend your season at least a month on either ends. That means you can get in there and plant your warm season crops earlier and have them go longer. Also, you can have a decreased evapotranspiration. This means that you'll have a higher water use efficiency and that you're not losing as much water in your soil from evapotranspiration. Also, you can have increased yields. If you want to look at more data, we have a bunch posted on the CSU Specialty Crops website. Also, you can increase the overall quality of your crop. This is especially true for strawberries, where you can get much more number one strawberries uh, in the tunnel compared to the field. And also for lettuce, where you'll have less bolting and less bitter taste. And finally, that you can have disease and insect pasture reductions. And if you do that, the vector diseases by the insect pests will be greatly reduced. And we have more research on that at the CSU website. And also, you'll see a great deal of hail protection. And this is really important, especially where we are in Fort Collins, that basically the tunnel can mean the difference between having a tomato crop or not having a tomato crop, that we can lose everything in the field, but the tunnel will be fine, and the tunnel itself stands up to the hail. However, there are some distinct concerns with summer production. And the primary one is managing the climate. You don't want to have the climate get too hot. And so you need to always be out there making sure your ventilation's working or rolling up and rolling down your sides. Another concern is your plant density. You sort of have to play with the trade-offs between having more plants per square foot, but also not reducing your yields. And you also need to ensure that you're getting a return on your investment with high value crops. You could plant things like broccoli in there, but they take up, per plant, they take up too much space to really be of value. And also the final concern is the, acceler the t higher temperatures within the tunnel can accelerate the growth and life cycle of some pests. 
so they can get out of control really quickly. So you need to be very vigilant on your pest management practices. Now we're going to talk about winter production. Overall, you can see basically three typical crops in winter production. They're greens, radish, and carrots. For the greens, you see spinach, lettuce, and Asian greens. Of those three, it seems like spinach has is doing the best in some of the trials we've been doing throughout the state, whereas the Asian greens are also very uh, frost tolerant and hardy. Some of the benefits of year-round production of winter production is that you'll be able to produce year-round in unheated or minimally heated high tunnels. This can help increase profits and extend your harvest and income throughout the year so you don't have to go into town and get a job if you're working at the farm during the winter. Also, year-round production and production in the winter allows you to maintain a market presence. After the summer, you've worked really hard to establish restaurant and grocery connections and then lose them in the winter and have to reestablish those every summer. But with a year-round presence, you can maintain those relationships. Also, there is a price premium associated with fresh winter local produce that can often yield high results. Another great advantage of winter production is that there's low weed pressure. That once you get things in there and weeded once or twice, the weeds don't really ever come back because it's just too a little light and too cold. However, your big concerns are frost protection. Uh, if these are these tunnels are out there exposed to the elements, and so to provide an additional level of frost protection, you need to use a floating row cover. We like to use an Agrobond 19 weight floating row cover, and you also want to make sure you're suspending that row cover above the crop. If it's touching the crop, it can freeze actually to the crop and create more damage. Then the other big issue for frost protection is whether or not you want to heat or not to heat your tunnel. Adding a heater adds cost and complexity to your system, but it can also really ensure that your crop will not only survive, but some crops strongly prefer to stay above freezing, uh, such as carrots. What a lot of growers do is they just set the thermostat at 33 degrees just to make sure nothing freezes, but they're not thin and spending a lot on fuel, unlike greenhouses. Your other big concern is over irrigation. Since it's so cold out and the plants aren't growing a lot, um, you're not having a lot of evapotranspiration. And also, and since the tunnel is usually sealed up very tightly to trap heat, Whatever does uh, evaporate or transpire stays within the tunnel. So you can look at your soil, and the surface may be dry, but if you just go in a little bit, you can see that it's still wet below the surface. So you want to make sure you're not over irrigating. The other concern is, again, this scheduling issue with summer crops that ideally you'd have your winter crops start planting in September. However, you're still harvesting tomatoes out of your tunnel and don't want to shut that production down. So you have to sort of balance between maximizing your summer and your winter yields. The other concern is the difficulty in finding markets for this produce sometimes, especially if you're used to direct marketing. Um, there's not a lot of winter farmers markets, though they are growing. Finally, I'd like to just talk about uh, some quick economics. Since the cost of high tunnels can be so variable, it's difficult to say when is a feasible payback period. Overall, the cost of a high tunnel can range to 50 cents to over $3 per square foot. Uh, 50 cents on the cheaper side if you're building it yourself, and $3 per square foot if you're going for more high end, and especially if you're adding a heater or automation. So if you're going for a very cheap version, the payback can be as low as one year. A very interesting study followed nine farms through a couple of years in Michigan, and the lowest payback period for the tunnels they built there was two years, and the highest was $74, 74 years, with an average of four years. This is for a pretty high-end high tunnel um, at $10,000 for almost 3,000 square feet. So you really need to know what you're getting into in terms of maximizing your profits and uh, what you can grow profitably in this space. So overall, I just want to end with some future research needs. I'm a soil scientist, so of course I'm interested in soil quality. 
there's not a lot of work done on soil quality within uh, high tunnels, especially in year-round production. We're just not quite sure what that year-round production does to the soil. And a particular concern is if we're demanding a lot out of the soil and producing year-round and heavily managing it, what does that do to the soil organic matter? Are we enriching it or depleting it? What's happening with the salinity within the soil? Are we compacting our soil? How does uh, year-round production or increased production affect the soil microbes, their growth, and their biomass? Uh, not a lot of research on the actual quantification of the reduction of erosion that you can see, and sort of comparing if you're growing year-round and keeping the cover on it year-round versus taking the cover off during the winter and the reduction of erosion there, and just the overall general effect of year-round production. Also, some of the more production methods that we need to work on is the schedule, scheduling, ideal planting dates for both summer and winter production. We'd also like to look more at variety trials for both summer and winter production. Some growers are utilizing cover crops and fallow periods for their tunnels, and just sort of seeing if that's beneficial or not. And also, there needs to be more work on enterprise budgeting and profitability in order to make sure everyone's making money on their high tunnel. There's lots of great resources out there. Um, any university extension should be very reliable. And some of the good ones out there are Kansas State, Cornell, and Penn State. There's lots of good books out there, uh, particular the Elliot Coleman books. They are adapted for Maine, but they have lots of good information that can be widely adapted. Um, also, the ATRA website has lots of great information for small-scale sustainable growers. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Jennifer Cook for organizing this. We'd also like to thank the Colorado Department of Agriculture, CSU Extension, the CSU Specialty Crops Program, and some uh, institutions that have helped funded high tunnel research here at Colorado State include uh, the Western SARE, OFRF, and the NRCS through their Conservation Innovation Grant. The references I had. So thank you so much. I went a little quicker than I thought, so we have plenty of time for questions. And we also have Dr. Frank Stoniker here, um, so he can help answer questions too. Okay, thanks, Dan. So before we start taking some questions, um, I'll ask Ruth to pop up those, those last evaluation questions just to help us um, kind of figure out how, how well this presentation was or how helpful it was for, for you all listening. So um, first question, based on what you knew before this presentation, what was the most helpful thing you learned today? The second one, please rate your knowledge of high tunnels after the presentation versus before. And then finally, do you plan to use the skills presented within the next year? So we'll give you time to go ahead and answer those. And I just wanted to remind you that the presentation today was recorded. Forgot to mention that at the beginning. So you can um, feel free to pass this on to other people or rewatch it if you need to. We'll post it on the Small Acres Management website, which is, um, I don't know, maybe Ruth, can you type it in? It's www.ext.colostate dot edu slash sam for small acres management and I have all of your emails who have registered so I'll also pass that link on to you via email this afternoon or tomorrow so um, as Dan mentioned we also have Dr. Frank Stoniker with us today to help answer some questions he's the, an assistant professor of the, at the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture and he's also a, the specialty crops program coordinator. I hope I got that right. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess we can go ahead and um, looks like everyone's finished answering the questions. Ruth, maybe if you want to pop the screen up big. There we go. And it looks like we already have some chats going. Uh, so let's see, maybe we can scroll up to the top here. Can you re recommend any specific anchoring? Um, usually you to bury uh, pipe and surround that in cement and then anchor it to that. Or also the tunnels themselves, you need to make sure the, the purlins and the frames and the rip. 
think um, there are hurricane anchors that are available that you can screw into the ground and anchor your structure or frame to that. And here along the front range where we have pretty stiff winds from time to time, um, we've been able to get by just with pounding our ground stakes and then anchoring the ribs to them, um, pounding them in about 18 inches. But in, in some high wind areas, I do know people that anchor at least the corners, if not maybe a couple of the center ribs in concrete footings. And, um, All right. Um, a question from Horton Nash. How do you prevent strong winds from entering the ends of the roll-up sides? We have seen this as a problem and can see it stressing the hoop house in stormy conditions. And Mike replied, planting a windbreak, perhaps. Or having, uh, instead of roll-up sides, is having sides that roll down, basically just inverting the way that it works. So that keeps, they'll break up the wind, especially from hitting your little baby transplants and stressing them out the most. Yeah, that works really well. The roll up, roll up instead of roll down sides are something that are used commonly in poultry barns. And so there are hardwares that, hardware materials that you can buy from um, poultry barn supply houses. And um, they have that technology. Also, what we've done, at our high tunnels in the past, you can buy a plastic mesh windbreak material and either place that just outside of the tunnel or actually right in the vent, depending upon how much ventilation you need. And that fabric windscreen um, obviously can really decrease the amount of air flowing through your tunnel. So if you move it away from the tunnel, um, it'll break up some of that velocity, but, but still give you some and it also, if you put it on the vent itself, it um, works to some degree as a insect mitigant. Um, obviously, butterflies can't fly through it, nor can bumblebees if you've got a pollinated crop. But the brightness and the reflectiveness of it seems to, to deter thrips and aphids from flying into your greenhouse as well. Our next question is from Carl Wilson. Um, have you seen voles or other animal pest problems getting into tunnels in Colorado? Uh, we do have some, some pest problems, especially in the winter time. Uh, we've had some vole ant problems. Uh, we've been pretty successful with just trapping them. We've been using bait. Summer? Yeah, voles have really been rough. Um, also, well, well, we'll stick with that. They have been our major problem. One year we, we grew strawberries in hay bales and bulls and mice completely destroyed those um, media for planting in. And so we've discontinued that project, even though the, the idea seemed sound, but we really increased our rodent population in a hurry. That was a nice home. Okay, the question from Wayne, he asks about cooling, um, evaporative pads or an evaporative misting system. So do misting systems promote a more unhealthy growing environment such as mold? Um, in terms of cooling and evaporative pads, that's just adding something that definitely needs electricity and to the structure and additional weight and would be pretty hard to do with the door on both ends, which would actually uh, make it harder to, to ventilate too. Um, so you could install it. Um, here in Colorado, it's, it's pretty hard to get high, high humidity in the tunnels, especially if you're side ventilating them, that they're probably pretty close to outside ambient humidity, so you wouldn't have problems with mold. Yeah, I think once you start installing evaporative pad systems, you're really looking at greenhouses instead of high tunnels. Switched into a greenhouse management concern. Um, in terms of misting, that is an opportunity, and there are 
there are low pressure misting systems that you could install above your crop to increase the humidity in the green have um, evaporative cooling that way. But evaporative cooling through misting works without really increasing the likelihood of disease. But if you're like Horton Nash down in Mississippi and you add um, misting to your system, you're probably going to be overrun in no time at all by all sorts of high humidity plant diseases. Okay, next question from Stephen Smith. Does the NRCS have a cost share program for high tunnels under EQIP? Um, the answer is yes, they did this year, and um, it was a pilot program, so not sure if they're going to offer it again next year, but check out with, um, be in touch with your local NRCS office, and you can go ahead and put your name on a list um, and apply for next year. Um, of course, you have to meet certain qualifications, um, so just, I'd say, check with your local NRCS office and go from there. The next question, what size hail will this withstand from Barb? Well, <laughs> let's see, the Hort Farm, we had, a, we had six hail events a couple of years ago, and none of the hail was larger than golf ball size. But it will, um, these greenhouse plastics that are six mil will hold up to golf ball size plastic pretty well. If you're out in Fort Morgan and you're getting grapefruit size hail, I'd probably um, wear a hard hat if you're going to be in the tunnel. So, but that, by and large, they're 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 quite stout. The more damage you get to the plastic, the shorter it will live. Um, but we've we've had our plastic on the tunnels for five years. They've had lots of hail on them and lots of wind on them, and they're still in pretty good shape. Our next question is from Don Briggs. Any research um, has any research been done comparing the geodesic design versus the Quonset or Gothic designs you talked about? Uh, we haven't done any, and I couldn't find any online. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not out there. I think the geodesic is not quite a high tunnel in that it's it's not ribs and uh, spate. You can't make it as long as you want. That it's more. It's not a tunnel, it's a dome. So, but I think a lot of the principles can be applied to geodesic domes. So. And certainly add a lot of strength. Those are incredibly strong structures. Um, so if you're in a high snow area, uh, a geodome might be a real nice option or alternative to a, t to a tunnel. All right, Lisa Brewer asks, how long can you expect the covers to last? Well, it depends on if you're using them for year-round production or only summer production and taking them off. Um, if you're taking them off at the end of each summer, they can easily last five years. Um, if you're using them year-round, um, I think it definitely shortens the life to about four. It just gets too cloudy and you'll lose too much light transmittance. Yeah, um, be sure to buy your plastic from a greenhouse supplier that's providing greenhouse quality plastics or polyethylenes. The stuff that you get at the hardware store for covering your floor when you paint um, will last about 30 to 60 days and then it'll start falling apart. And the greenhouse plastics have really improved and, and it's not uncommon to get five or six years out of them, even in our high light situations here. Gordon Nash asks Frank, give us some greenhouse varieties that have produced well. Heirlooms. Of tomatoes. Oh, maters. Oh, mater. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Tomato. In Mississippi, they're known as maters, yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Horton. Um, there, are, there are lots of really good greenhouse variety of tomatoes, and if you're growing heirlooms, we found over and over again that many of the heirloom varieties will produce two or three nice trusses of fruit, and then they start aborting after that for several trusses before you um, get into good production. There are a lot of gre greenhouse varieties like Trust and Cobra and Big Dina that are 
very well adapted to greenhouse production and, and should do very well, and they've done well in our trials as well. Of course, as Horton knows, my favorite is Arkansas Traveler. It's a delicious, indeterminate tomato that um, might fit somebody's description as an heirloom, but it's a it's a hybrid. But it's um... anyway, try them out. We're constantly doing variety trials at CSU, and we have a lot of that information up on our website. Let us know what you like, and we'll give it a shot. Question from Richard, are backyard high tunnels permitted in Denver? That I don't know. You guys? Um, yeah, I think you probably would want to talk to someone locally, but would definitely be permitted be something more known as like low tunnels or quick hoops, where you're not building a giant structure, but rather just um, a hoop that spans you know, only five feet, that it's only a couple feet high that you cover with the same sort of greenhouse plastic and you can ventilate by just kind of shimmying up the sides of the plastic. So there's the great resources in that Four Season Harvest book can be applied to a backyard gardening situation too. Robert asks, was the drip irrigation hose I saw the soaker hose type? Would a very small scale system work with drip emitters spaced every foot or so? And how deep or wide would the water soak into the soil. Um, the drip that we use is T-tape, so it's not the soaker hose. Um, so I think our, our standard drip spacing is 8 inches. Mm -hmm. It's 8 inches. And the thing about drip tape is um, how deep slash wide changes within the soil profile. That if, if the drip tape's running at you, it's the the moisture is going to start like this and then go down, so it will get um, the wi the wideness increases with depth. So it's not great for germinating something at the surface like a salad crop that needs to surface all at the top. But if you have a more deeply rooted tomato crop, um, it can access when the water drips down wider. So also that depends on the soil type, um, and so the sandier it is, the Shout the wider it'll go quicker, the clayier it is, have long, harder to get further wider. And there's issues with drainage and all that too. Um, Mike has the next question. Any indeterminate tomato can be trellised? Oh, I guess that's a statement. Is so that true? Any indeterminate tomato can be trellised? Yes. 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 And we prefer to use indeterminate varieties for if you're going to be trellising them in the tunnel. Um, if you're growing a bush type, you'll get a heavy set very low. You don't need to trellis it up. So you can just grow it as a bush, and that's fine. Um, we can plant more plants, more indeterminate plants in a tunnel when we're planting them about a foot between plants, and we get five rows into our 20-foot wide tunnel. Um, that gives us about... One, well, you count the number of heads per plant because you can produce liters off of a indeterminate plant so that you have a higher plant density than actually what is in the ground. And you're probably aiming for about two heads per square meter in your tunnel. And a square meter is about 10 square feet. So that's a good density for tomatoes, for indeterminate tomatoes in a, in a high tunnel. All right, Naomi, will melons do well inside? Melons do well in tunnels, and, and some greenhouse varieties are grown commonly in high tunnels. You do need pollinators, and so if you don't have bumblebees arriving on your own, you can introduce bumblebees in your tunnel, and you can buy those commercially for that use. Um, <clears throat> we have we found it in our evaluations initially that melons didn't yield enough to um, come close to tomatoes, for example, for, for returns in a tunnel. And so they're, they're not something that we're continuing to look at at this point. But they're, yes, they're certainly producible. Cucumbers and tomatoes have really been our best crops thus far, and, and salad greens. 
Debbie asks, what is the approximate cost to recover after the normal four-year time? I guess that depends on how fancy of a high tunnel you're building. Um, so you, you can definitely, if it's a simple high tunnel that has low cost per square foot, you can definitely recover that within one year, one growing season. That if you're planting a high value crop of tomatoes, um, you can easily get it. Uh, a yield difference that will pay for the tunnel. Um, if you have a more complicated tunnel, it's a dual wall inflated and heated, um, it probably will take four years to repay. I think if you were asking about plastic costs, they're changing so quickly with the cost of oil. Um, when we recovered our tunnels, Three or four years ago, I think they were about about two hundred dollars per fifty foot by twenty foot tunnel. Um, so you'll just have to check with the greenhouse supply house for for greenhouse plastic costs. But they are going up as obviously oil prices go up. All right, um, Wyoma, I think I'm pronouncing your name right. I have a small tunnel and notice flying insects almost immediately after putting up the poly. Do you have any re recommendations for controlling these? Well, I think you need to find out if the flying insects are pests or not. There are lots of beneficial insects that fly. So if you can capture some and um, either identify them yourself or, or send them into a plant ID clinic or a pest ID clinic here at CSU, we can give you an answer on those. Um, I've also noticed that when we put our tunnels up, there are a lot of flies that um, get trapped in the tunnels early on, and those are probably coming out of compost in our high organic matter soils where the larvae live. Um, but greenhouse, these tunnels can trap a lot, trap a lot of beneficial insects, unfortunately, and, and kill them. They get stuck and they can't find a way out but certainly have, have those ID'd before you try to control anybody. And if you do need to control something, please read pesticide labels. Um, if you use pesticides in high tunnels, they should be labeled for greenhouse use. And by and large, um, the small high tunnel producer can probably do very well using biological control and um, even hand picking off a lot of the pests. All right, Debbie is responding back to the hail damage question. Um, if the cover is damaged, are there patch kits? Uh, there definitely are. You can buy tape that's UV rated uh, tape. So if you get a damage through hail or you put a handle of a tool through your plastic, it's just it's not the end of the world. You don't have to go buy another big roll of plastic. So there are patch kits. Okay. Are there suppliers of high tunnels in northeast Colorado that either of you know of? And are there pros and cons for buying local versus internet purchases? Well, there are, there are lots and lots of um, suppliers of high tunnels now. Almost all of the greenhouse supply companies have their own brand. And um, we do have a company here in Colorado that I don't know if we can talk about trade names or not. But um, Nexus is a greenhouse company here in Colorado, and there are some distributors for them here. There's also a greenhouse supply company in Kansas, um, plenty on the east and west coasts. And so do look at freight when you're talking about importing these materials, because the freight can really gobble up some of your profit the first year. And if quite often double the cost of your tunnel if you're shipping it across the country. Okay, could you guys address orientation? This is from Buffy. Could you address orientation for an acre with high winds from the west and southwest? Um, again, you just can orientate it uh, going from west to east. If your winds are coming from the west that way, the narrow side of your tunnel is facing into the wind. 
rather than the broad side. And that way you also get your maximum solar exposure. Additionally on that, bracing is really, really important. If, you're, if you know you're going to have 80, 90, 100 mile per hour winds, um, certainly anchor the building well. But if you have diagonal bracing in your tunnel, in addition to the longitudinal purlins that, that um, Dan mentioned in the construction, those will add a lot of stability to your building. And we've never done it, but every year I say I'm going to do it as I see those buildings shift a little bit in the big winds. All right, Darren, um, you mentioned manure in the houses. Have you all measured salt levels in your soils? And if you've seen them increase, how do you, I don't even know that word, ameliorate that? Maybe explain that too, because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> uh, I think that just takes care of the salt problems. Right. Um, so we have our soils tested every year. Um, we haven't had a buildup of salts. Um, we, if you did have a problem, I think basically your only solution would be leaching it out of your soils with low salt water. Um, I think with the decreased evapotranspirations, you're not getting probably as much salt buildup. Since you're not evaporating as much water from your soil, that leaves the salts behind. So that could be a definite advantage of high tunnels versus field production, especially in organic systems where manure and compost are used. I think sort of as a side note, it, it's interesting to me um, how much manure people apply to the gardens and, and, and high tunnels for that matter. And oftentimes the recommendations are measured in inches. And inches of manure or compost equate to tens of tons of, of application per acre, which is way too much. So please soil test and please understand how many pounds of actual nutrient you're applying when you apply compost or, or manure. A, a very, very thin scattering um, that barely changes the color of the surface of the soil is probably about 10 tons per acre. So. Make sure that you're not over applying. If you're over applying, you're going to run into salt problems. But the likelihood of, of over applying with, with light applications is not so great. Leave it at that. Mary asks uh, Do you have any information on the 5.2 ounce fabric as compared to the 6 mil plastic? Um, no, I'm not sure if you're referring to plastic or, or another kind of fabric. We, if you look at the CSU website that compares floating row cover material, that was a half ounce per square yard, a very lightweight material. Um, and then there is a tough, tough bell poly, polyvinyl alcohol material, um, and also just regular insect screening for greenhouses that were all compared to regular plastic. And the insect screening and the polyvinyl alcohol held up comparatively well to the plastic. Um, so I think a lot of that you'd, you'd want to look into longevity and, and how solar stable they are when you're comparing them to the 6 mil, mil plastic. All right, another question on wind. Our winter winds uh, come from the northeast, summer winds from the southwest, but damaging winds are from the west. Should we still orient east to west? Yes. That If they're coming from the west, the damaging winds are coming from the west, put your narrow side facing those rather than the broad side. Okay, the next question is from Joel. How long do greenhouse quality plastics? Sorry, how long can greenhouse quality plastics be stored? Is there a maximum life or expiration date? I think the storage of those greenhouse plastics, generally they come in, a, in an opaque wrapper. And if they're not set in a real hot place where they might melt the plastic, um, I imagine it's indefinite. I've never run into a roll that's been stored that's that's been bad because it was stored unless it was stored in a sunny spot where it actually melted um, and and of course that that could be a problem 
Okay, how long, uh, this is again from Joel, how long can the, oh no, sorry, I just asked that. <laughs> the next question is from Mike, um, where, where I've put, oh, I guess where he's put a high tunnel, the winds are mainly from the south and the north. Is it more important to orient for wind or east-west for sun exposure? It depends on if you're trying to produce throughout the summer and the winter or just the summer. Um, and probably you want your structure to survive, so if that's the big consideration, you can orient it north-south. We're kind of right at um, the parallel where it, you can do it either way, So, but definitely for the winter production, you get much more sun going east-west. Buffy asks, do you have any experience with solar-powered vents? Um, I don't have any experience. Um, the, those passive solar vents that use wax are really pretty slick and seem to work very good for um, regulating temperature without needing any electricity. Yeah, likewise. I've never used them. I know a lot of people that do, and they like them quite well. Um, those are the those wax piston vents that, that Dan's been talking about. And a lot of people supply them now. They're very inexpensive, and they seem to hold up for a long time. I think the, the question is how much weight they'll lift. And so make sure to design your vent so that that little arm can, can handle it. And then Buffy asks, uh, do you catch rainwater from your tunnels to use for irrigation? Uh, we don't. I uh, imagine you could, but we don't. I'd imagine there, Buffy, there might be some legal issues, so I'd maybe recommend talking with the Department of, what is the Department of Water and Natural Resources or something like that. I forget the exact title. But um, yeah, I'd imagine there'd be some some permits that you'd need to get it before you did that. Um, Mary says 5.2 fabric is plastic with an embedded mesh for strength. Offered by FarmTech. Okay, that, sorry, that was just a comment. Yeah, well, I think she was asking, but comparing that just to the normal poly that we were using that she asked before that we didn't know what it was. Um, so I don't have any experience with that. I think um, that's probably a, an opaque material or, or partially translucent, the 5.2 material. And that might be really good for roll-up walls or something that takes a lot of abrasion. Um, as far as a growing plastic, I, I would expect it would um, reduce your light transmission a whole lot. So that would be a compromise. Are greenhouse plastics typically PBA free from Stephanie? We don't know. All right. And I guess another question that I had, as someone had emailed me and I just thought of it now, they're wondering about recycling of these plastics because they have to be, you know, after so many five, three to five years, they have to be, you know, thrown away. Is there a possibility of being able to recycle them or not really? When one option for recycling is if you could contact one of the larger greenhouse growers in your area that uses plastic roofs, quite often they'll bundle them into truck-sized loads that are sent to recyclers. Unfortunately, we don't have small-scale recycling for agricultural plastics in Colorado. Um, some other states that use a lot of plastics um, in agriculture have a more aggressive recycling programs. And again, with the increased price in oil, there may be more of a market for agricultural plastics. There was, for a few years, a, a real glut of plastics on the market, and so agricultural plastics were way down on the uh, preference list in terms of what you were able to find a home for. You can certainly use these used greenhouse covers for solarizing soil, too, if you're, if you're trying to manage some weeds. Um, there are lots of secondary uses for a, a greenhouse cover that maybe isn't as light transmissive as it was once upon a time. Um, but as far as recycling, that's been a challenge in Colorado. You might check EcoCycle in Boulder. 
Hey, I think this is the last question. Did CSU build and design the high tunnels you use? Uh, the tunnels that we bought are kits, and these are Nexus kits. I've built tunnels from lots of different providers as well as made my own from scratch. And um, I think there are so many options available now on the market that you can really do quite well by buying a kit. And they have everything you need. Um, so it just depends on your preference. I think you can do well either way, building it yourself or, or buying a ready-made product. Good, and it looks like we're just at 1 o'clock. I'll take this final question um, from Robert. Have you seen the hoop houses use uh, bird screening, like used to protect fruit trees, to reduce the amount of sun by replacing the plastic film for better salad growing, less chance to bolt? Um, I haven't seen people using bird screening, but you can use uh, an additional la layer of shade cloth or even like whitewashing the tunnels themselves. That should really help reduce bolting. Um, and the presentation on that paper that talked about proving lettuce quality, that's something they definitely did and recommended that providing shade cloth over the structure um, not only reduce bolting, but also uh, decreased bitterness. All right. Well, I'd like to thank um, Dan and Frank for being here and thank all of you listeners out there for for being so interested in this topic. It seems like it's a really popular topic, so hopefully we'll uh, maybe come up with some more webinars or workshops for everyone in the future. Um, so thanks for listening, and just a reminder, we've got I've got two more webinars planned in the future. Small-scale cattle production is on May 18th from noon to 1, and raising sheep and goats is on August 11th from noon to 1. So you can go ahead and email me if you'd like to register for those. My email is jennifer.cook at colostate.edu. Thanks, and have a great day.